Today, I take an entire year's worth of extra epoxy and attempt to turn it into one of the coolest coffee tables I've ever made with some really weird design inspiration on four eyes. It's hard to tell looking at these two shots, but they're actually filmed a year apart. I guess my hat's a little dirtier here. And I guess the reason that I'm mentioning that is that this project started a year ago, back when I was making this piece which was the second slab and epoxy thing that I ever built and the moment that I realized that I had mixed way more epoxy for a pour than what I needed and that I'd better come up with something to do with it. Otherwise, I was about to waste a lot of money. So as you can see here, in that moment, I quickly slapped together this little form so that I'd have a place to dump that extra epoxy. And for some reason, I filmed it in slow motion. I think I thought it would be cool. It wasn't. But anyway, that was on July 29th, 2022. Then here we are on August 1st. Then again, another month later on September 1st. And anyway, several months and multiple fly burials later, I figured that I had enough epoxy and that brings us to today. Or I guess that depends on when you're watching this, but July 19th, 2023. Now, this should be the first and only time that I ever make a project like this because thankfully I've gotten a lot better at estimating how much epoxy to use for a pour. And I could sit here and tell you that I use some kind of fancy equation to do that, but the truth is I just kind of eyeball it. And that's not to say that there aren't formulas that you could use. Probably the best one that I've heard is from Cam at Blacktail Studio. He measures the gap between his slabs along the entire length every two inches or so. And with that and the depth, he can calculate the approximate cubic volume. Though I bet if you got a couple Zimas in him, he'd admit he just eyeballs it too. Also, there's no shortage of overly elaborate methods that I get comments about. But either way, like I said, hopefully this should be the one and only time that I end up with a bunch of extra epoxy. And I figured it was either build this or just feed it to some sea turtles. Okay, so here I'm at my CNC to cut out the shape that I want for the top, which is going to be this shape. And if you're anything like me, your first instinct would be to call this an oval. But just like me, you would be wrong. So I kind of went down the shape names rabbit hole with this one, and here's what I found out. So it's not an oval, and it's not an ellipse, but rather a shape that can go by six different names. And I'll list them here, and you can guess which one my favorite is. But you can call it a stadium, a pill, an aubround, a squectangle, a disco rectangle, or a sausage body. I've been dreading this part since I first thought about this project, which is why I saved it till the end of my workday. That way I can do it, make a mess, and then go home. And that is routing an edge profile on this top. So I don't know if you've ever routed epoxy, but God, I should really have one of those suits. Those zip, you know, like a painter. As soon as I'm done recording this, I'm gonna go get one of those, then I'm gonna come back and do this. XL's the smallest they got, I don't think. Oh well, whatever. I guess it doesn't need to be form-fitting. But anyway, if you've ever routed epoxy, you know that it gets these... like static charged flakes all over the place. They just stick all over you. Let's just get this over with. I'm gonna go grab the suit, do this and then we'll move on with our lives. So at this point, the top still needs a ton of work to get it looking good. But on this one, the base is definitely gonna be the star of the show. Honestly, when the whole piece is done and sitting in somebody's living room, I'd be kind of curious to know what most people will think the top is even made out of. I don't think your average person would think epoxy, I mean, if they've even heard of epoxy, they probably think of it more as an adhesive or like a finish or a sealant. Maybe they'd think it was a big, thick chunk of glass or a piece of acrylic. And if they do think either of those things, that's good because that would mean that I've gotten the glass-like finish that I'm going for. But anyway, I'm getting off topic. The point that I wanted to make was no matter what they think the top is made out of, they should definitely think that it's just a thing that's sitting on top of a really cool base. And the base is actually the thing. So 
So here you can see what I've done at this point is make myself a few template pieces. And these are for the leg shape. And the design for this piece has a kind of weird backstory. So a few minutes ago, I mentioned the fly burials. And I don't know if flies are attracted to curing epoxy or what, but on three separate occasions, flies landed on the top as it was curing, got stuck, and that was it. Which actually, now that I'm saying that aloud, is kind of weird. I mean, I've done dozens of other epoxy pours, and there have been zero other times that a fly's landed in one. Yet, here, three times. But, whatever, I guess I thought it would be a fitting tribute to make the base inspired by a fly. Now, my first attempts at this sucked. They're just really goofy and gimmicky looking, and way too on the nose. So I tried to really boil it down to the most basic shapes that I could, and here's where I landed. So if you look at a fly, and I hope they don't take this the wrong way, but they kind of have a sausage bod. But where I took more inspiration was from their legs. First, they have six of them. And more importantly, they all kind of branch out from the center of their hairy little sausage bodies. So I went through a bunch of different versions and finally settled on the version that you see me drawing here. And to be clear, without that little backstory, I don't think that anybody would ever look at this table and say, hey, look, a fly. But now you know how I got here. And also, people always ask me where I get inspiration from or what books I read, and I never have a good answer. I mean, the answer to the book question is none. So not good, but at least definitive. And now as an answer to the first question about where inspiration comes from, I guess if I want to give a bad answer, I could say flies. But if I want to give a good answer, or at least a truthful one, I could say anywhere. So you just saw me cut out six pieces that match this template piece of my leg. And next I needed to cut six of the other two pieces that make up the leg shape. So to do that, I'm going to cut my remaining wood into six oversized chunks. And from each one of these chunks, I should be able to get two slightly smaller chunks that'll become my finished leg parts. Which I guess is what all woodworking is. Taking big chunks and turning them into smaller and smaller chunks until eventually you put them all back together into a bigger chunk. But with all of my chunks adequately chunked, I can make some precision cuts. So what I'm doing here is using this crosscut sled and making the fence match the angle of my workpiece and then cutting the joint face on all six pieces. And that's not to say that you have to have this sled to do it. You could also do it with a miter gauge, like you see me doing here. And a little later in the video, I'll show how you can also do this with just some scrap plywood. A couple minutes ago, you might have noticed a graphic that said that this piece was going to be for auction. Now, if you're interested in bidding on it, obviously you should wait until the end of the video to make sure that it's something you'd actually like. But I wanted to quickly say that whatever money I get from this, I'm gonna donate to a charity that's important to me. And not only that, but I'm actually gonna match the winning bid. Now, part of the reason that I can do this is because of the support that I get from channel sponsors. In fact, today's sponsor, Ethos, was even kind enough to let me continue showing the progress of the build during the ad read. So while I keep working over there, let's talk about something uncomfortable. Life insurance. Now I think that there's two main reasons that people put off getting life insurance. First is because it means thinking about something that most people don't like to think about. And unfortunately, Ethos can't solve that problem. But ignoring it doesn't really help either. And I think it's something that's crucial to do for those that we could leave behind. Personally, being the main provider for my family, I know if something happens to me, I want to make sure that my family is taken care of no matter what. Obviously, that's going to be a difficult situation, and I don't want to pile on financial burdens like our mortgage. And then the second reason is, traditionally, it's kind of been a hassle. And here, thankfully, Ethos can help. So they've made the entire process way simpler, faster, and more affordable. To the point where you can get a quote in just minutes online without any medical exams. You just need to answer a few health questions. Plus the rates, which obviously are going to depend on you, your age, and what you're looking for. But you might be shocked by how affordable a policy can be. And if this is something that you've been putting off, stop. Because waiting to get life insurance only makes it more expensive. Typically, premiums rise by 8-10% to 10 every year that you wait as you get older. 
So if you're interested in learning more about Ethos and getting a free life insurance quote, I put a link in the description of this video so that you can get the ball rolling. And thank you again, Ethos, for sponsoring this video. Okay, so what you just saw there was me gluing together the three pieces that make up each leg and then using my templates to refine the shapes. And at this point, they're still pretty clunky looking, but the general shape is there. And once we get these cracks stabilized, we can make the pieces look more like fly legs, which I guess is what we're doing. So while we let that epoxy cure, let's turn our attention back to this epoxy. So earlier in the video, I had a shot where I was securing the epoxy slab down to the CNC, and I put up a graphic saying this was a bad idea. Well, here's where I first realized that. Basically, I thought I could just fill in my screw holes with epoxy and they would go away. But after about 30 minutes of pretty aggressive sanding, I realized that it wasn't going to happen. So I needed to think of a solution. So I marked out where the center of the two circles on the top would be to see how far away from that my screw holes were. And you can see in this shot that they aren't symmetrical, but they're both pretty close to that point. So I decided I would use my CNC to cut out a spot for a disc that could cover the screw holes. And I didn't get a very good shot of this on my first one but thankfully I had a second chance to redeem myself and I didn't do a very good job here either. But thankfully I still had to use the CNC to cut out the two discs and here I did do a good job. Twice. And then to clamp them in, I rigged up this little two by four situation you see here since no clamps would have been long enough to reach in. Now, I don't know if I was just in a cnc mood at this point or what, but the next thing that I had to do was make two of this sort of spine shape that all of the legs are going to attach to. And making this is pretty much going to be the same process that I used to make the legs, so I decided I would try to do it on the CNC as well. So a question I get a lot is, why don't you just use the CNC for everything? And there's two reasons. First, and honestly the main reason for me, is I'm not a furniture manufacturer. At the end of the day, I'm a guy who builds and designs one-off custom pieces of furniture, but even more so than being a furniture maker, I would say that I'm a video maker. I mean, the reality is one person is going to have this table, but thousands, or with any luck, maybe even millions of people will see the video. And for that reason, I believe that the video is the product. So all of that is to say, I think doing everything on a CNC would be kind of boring, and really unrelatable to most people watching. And then reason two I don't do everything on the CNC is because here's what your joint faces will look like. So since the CNC cuts with a router, you're gonna get tear out at certain spots. So the way that I work around this is to leave those spots a little long. And then I use the table saw with a sled to magically clean things up. By the way, I should also mention that this isn't only a problem if you're using a CNC. This is pretty much true with any router. So remember when I made the legs the non-digital way, I used my templates in a router? Well, if I had tried to route the joint faces with that router, I pretty much would have had the same problem. Which is why here, you can see that I've got my leg assemblies and I'm doing the same thing, cutting the joint faces. And then I also need to take a cut off the top and bottom of the legs. And then once I've done that, I'll have roughed out all of my base pieces. So kind of getting back to what I was saying, I know that for a lot of people watching these videos, it's just entertainment. But if you are one of the few people who would classify yourself as somebody who builds furniture, say maybe in the late beginner to intermediate skill level, I don't like to brag, and obviously I'm biased, but I think that Sean and I make the best plans out there. And we're actually working on a new one as we speak for a piece called the Static Media Console. In fact, you might remember a couple minutes ago when I showed this graphic. Well, that was based off the static. And here's what it looks like if you tell AI to place it in a modern, minimalist living room. Anyway, our courses aren't like normal plans. They're extremely in-depth. And until this plan gets released, we're doing a pre-sale so you can snag it for $15 off. And if you're just not interested in this piece... We got a bunch of others on lounge chairs, dressers, and desks, and you know what? I'll just leave a link in the description so you can go learn more if that's something you're interested in. And if not, don't worry about it. 
All right, so while the glue is drying, we can head back over to the top. And first, I'm going to use the CNC again to flatten the wood down to the same height as the rest of the top. And you can see here, I kind of gouged into it a little bit. But anyway, then I'm going to try experimenting with something. So what you see here is the underside of the top, and all of these lines are from the tape that was on the form while it cured. So I figured rather than trying to sand through everything, I'd mix up a little bit of epoxy and do a sort of skim coat. So I just kind of slathered it on thick and sloppy, and it does a pretty good job of self-leveling during the day or so that it takes to cure. And since it worked so well on the bottom, I figured I'd do the same thing on the top. So a minute ago when I was cutting the big roundovers, you might have noticed that I stopped short of these joint faces, which is why now they look like this. And the reason that I did that is because if you try to do it all before the glue up, you're likely to accidentally round over this part of your piece and end up with this weird little curve in the joint. So I just leave them blocky and then use a rasp and do a bunch of sanding to clean everything up. And this is one of those things where if you do it this way, you know it's gonna be a lot of work. So it's always tempting to try to do it the other way, rounding over before the glue up. But if you do mess that up, it's going to be a lot, lot more work. So always play it safe and take the guaranteed a lot more work instead of risking the a lot, lot more work. Here's what it looks like at regular speed. Let's pick things back up. So at this point, the base is looking really good and... I could really just work my way through all of the grits of sandpaper and put on a few coats of finish, which gave me plenty of time to worry about how the top was going to turn out. And I'll be honest, at this point, I was probably about 50-50 on it. And let's just go have a look at it. So the top coat did a pretty good job of leveling things out. You can still see that it was slightly shallow right here, where I accidentally gouged into it. But after... I don't know, maybe 30 minutes of sanding, I'd worked my way down to what looked like a pretty flat top. But one thing that was giving me concern was that my disc here is pretty much exposed, but here it's clearly still buried under epoxy, which means that the top is either not flat or not evenly thick everywhere. And what this told me is that pretty much I should have done what I'd been trying to avoid since the beginning and just take the whole thing over to the CNC and run a flattening pass. And right here, you can see that the piece is clearly thicker around the perimeter and thinner towards the center. Now, the reason that I'd been avoiding this is kind of for the same reason that I don't like routing epoxy in general. But here, instead of it getting all over you, it clogs up your dust collector and it gets a bunch of microscopic epoxy dust in the air. Which, I'm not a scientist, but doesn't seem good. Also, me and dust collectors haven't been really getting along too well lately. If you saw my last video, you might remember when I almost burned my shop down. But thankfully here, I gotta say that my new dust collector handled it like a champ. Laguna, you make a fine product. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna do is gonna take a really long time, but I'm gonna gloss over it in this video. And that is polishing this thing up to a nice shiny sausage body. So this is gonna be the Cliff Notes tutorial. And in fact, I'll just throw a link to the video that I found where a guy explains it in a ton of detail. That way the 17 of you who are actually going to do this can get good info there instead of the four dummies version that I'm about to do. So basically I need to sand every surface with the following grits. 80, 120, 180, 240, 400, 800, 1200. And for each grit, you want to do a really slow overlapping pass one way on the entire surface then again, moving perpendicular to your first pass. And after doing that, wipe off all of the dust, let it dry, and do that five times for each grit. And I'd say just get some good music or a good podcast to listen to because you're going to be doing this for a long time. I'd say each pass takes maybe five minutes. So that's seven grits times five passes times five minutes, which is about three hours for one face. And of course, there are two faces and the entire perimeter. And the only other thing to mention is once you get up to 1200, you're gonna wet sand, which might not sound too exciting, but after hours of dry sanding, anything different's pretty good. Plus everything's better wet, be it a burrito, a bandit, or otherwise. And then after you've done all of that, you can polish, which is where that shine really starts to come out. All right, here's the deal. 
I don't think I like this that much, which is kind of weird to say after you just spent literally dozens of hours sanding and polishing something. And honestly, maybe that's part of the reason. Maybe it's because I spent so much time on this one single part of it that now maybe I feel disappointed or something. I don't know. And it's not that it looks bad. I think that it does look cool. I think what I really don't like about it has more to do with kind of the utility of it. I just think maybe an all black shiny epoxy top isn't a good material for a coffee table that's gonna get used. It's kind of like a black car. Like they look awesome when they're clean and shiny, but when they're not, it shows every little speck of dirt and every scratch, if somebody touched it, fingerprints. So I think I have a pretty easy solution. And that is to make a second top for this piece out of wood. So maybe that's what you're gonna watch me do real quick right now. We'll just rush right through that. Basically, I'm gonna replicate this top, same dimensions, same shape, out of wood. Luckily, I got a few boards of walnut sitting around that I can quickly do that with. Not gonna go into any detail there. And then you can see both of them and let me know what you think about it. So obviously a piece of furniture being usable is something that is always gonna be important to me. But on this one, it's kind of extra important since this piece, like I said earlier, is up for auction and I don't know where it's gonna end up. So here's what I'm thinking. I got a link in the description for anybody interested in bidding on it. And again, all the money raised is gonna go to an awesome charity. And then whoever is the winning bidder gets their choice. They can have whichever top they want. And if they pick the epoxy one, I'll figure out something else to do with the wooden one. And if they pick the wooden one, then I'll figure out something else to do with the epoxy top. I'm not sure what it'll be. I know that it won't be a tabletop if it's my choice. So maybe bon appetit. I'm joking, I'll figure out something to do with it. Thanks for watching. I don't think this is my workshop.